ever since I was very little, I wanted to be on a Disney channel. I loved singing, acting and dancing. Like Taylor Swift in Hannah Montana. Even now, she's my idol. But every time I tried to sing, a weird noise came out. I have tried to get better and I sign up for some piano lessons, but pity my piano teacher who tried to help me. My voice remained definitely bad. I mean, one thing was clear, my Disney career was over. But you see, I'm the curious kind. I started wondering why my singing was bad. I wonder what is to blame for this selective musical sabotage? Is it my brain, my ear, or my vocal cords? In search for answers, I started reading scientific literature. And you see, um, Google wasn't a thing back then. So I actually had to go to the library. There, I found this one paper and I learned that the brains of bad singers are to blame for their inability to hit the right pitch. I came to realize that the brains of bad singers associate a note we hear with the wrong muscle movement in the voice. The wires are crossed. In my case, when I hear an E and call upon my brains to reproduce it, my brain commands my voice to produce a G sharp. It is as something or someone switched around all my keys on my computer keyboard and punching the letter B produces the letter F. My ear knows better, <laughs> which is why I cringe when I hear myself, but I cannot easily reprogram my brain. I became fascinated by these brains that cannot hit the right pitch. And somehow, along the way, I came out as a scientist. But you see, as a scientist, we spend a lot of time hanging out in the labs. We, we don't get many opportunities to tell the world what our work is all about or why it's cool. Many people out there already feel excluded by science. They use their laptops, they fly in planes, use appliances in home, but don't know what is behind this technology. I wanted to change that. I wanted more non-scientists to have the opportunity to think along with the scientists, to think along with them as they are designing those lithium-ion batteries for our laptops, or making those smart refrigerators and stoves that are Wi-Fi enabled and controllable by apps. So I started thinking whether there's a way that I myself use modern technology to tell science stories in different ways and tell different kinds of stories. Stories that capture imagination and invite people to have a much better understanding of science. I started experimenting and what I was trying to do was to turn my work, my science, into the virtual reality game. Eventually, a VR game bug of pain was created. When I saw the authentic reactions of people playing this game, it became clear to me that what we have here is a learning and communicating tool that shows that science is fun, accessible, and meaningful. 
My research even showed that VR games are having valuable educational benefits. So, for example, the students playing the game perform better on the test than the group that was learning from textbooks or video projections. And um, that made me um, quite excited about the possibility that such games can help to engage thousands, if not millions, of people in scientific process. Right. But why? And here's why. Those are facial expressions of two people playing a VR game. It seems like they have been transported somewhere completely different. And you can see this sense of urgency, fun, wonder, as well as intense focus and concentration. So this photo pretty much sums up why VR games can engage masses in solving a tough scientific problem, such as climate change, poverty, water shortage, malnutrition, and even finding a way to combat viruses. But these two people are not the only two who play games. There are more than 500 million people out there who play games globally. And all these folks must be extraordinary good at something. If we can produce a game that can benefit society with that level of engagement, we can solve scientific mysteries quicker and cheaper. What I'm talking about here is about using VR games to tap into collective intelligence and wisdom of millions of non-experts. In other words, we pull people together to solve a scientific mystery that is perceived as pain to deal with. Together, we can then solve scientific problems such as climate change, poverty, water shortage, malnutrition, and even finding a way to combat viruses. These games are known as serious games. And when we develop a serious game, we try to combine the best of the both worlds, the power of research and our expertise in game development. The combination gives us the opportunity to make a game effective and fun. Scientists, game designers and developers creating such games actually figure out that people are just fantastic at solving tough scientific problems and people playing such games are not scientists. Let me show you a few examples of such serious games. That one is called Sea Hero Crest and was developed to help scientists fight dementia. The way in which players navigate the game help researchers to understand the mental process of 3D navigation, which is one of the first skills lost in dementia. So far, more than 4 million people play the game and contributed to identifying the early signs of Alzheimer's disease. One of the top players was a lady working in a grocery store with no prior scientific background. Another example I would like to share with you today has to do with surgical training. First, it's impossible to have a real life training session because of potential fatalities. Secondly, the traditional surgical training method use simulators that are extremely expensive. But what researchers also noticed is that the surgeons enjoy playing games on their smartphone during their breaks, um, games such as Angry Birds. So what if the surgical training is transformed into an experience as exciting as Angry Birds? Fast forward and now we have a game called Underground. In an exciting world, the surgeons play Sadie a brave girl who has to free her robot Frank Swank from the mines. 
With a customized laparoscopic controller, the surgeons must complete challenges that will train their kinetic skills. The third example is called Endeavor RX for treatment of children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Endeavor RX can officially be prescribed as a treatment for this disease. And it's the first of its kind. Until now, a game has never been an improved treatment for a medical condition. The last example I wanted to show is a VR game called Reducept, and the game is used to reduce chronic pain. Virtual reality is a success factor here. Scientific knowledge about virtual reality, pain education, and psychology shows that you can teach your brain to gain more control and reduce pain in the long term. Which again brings me back to the power of virtual reality. You feel immersed in the world you don't know anything about. And you feel present in that world and characters that you're inside that world with. It can connect scientists to other non-scientists in a meaningful way that I've never seen before with any other type of communication. And it can change perception of science. And that's why I believe that virtual reality has the potential to be a game changer in science communication and education. Essentially, it's a game. But via this game, science can become more accessible to society, more integrated into pop culture. And ultimately, we create more diverse, inclusive and collaborative knowledge culture. Thank you.